living dangerously this morning. Right when uh, she was playing the piano a second ago, I said, what would you do if I closed the book on you? <laughs> Some people are just mean. I won't tell you what she said. We're in church, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, it's good to see everybody this morning. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Let's sing for a little bit. So let's grab our hymn books and stand. Turn to hymn number six. It's very hard to find. It's right after number five, just so you know. Hymn number six, and we'll sing How Firm a Foundation. Hymn number six. Oh 
that's a song we should know. <laughs> but as I'm reading through, I thought, my goodness, I don't know this as well as I thought I did. <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you again for the good singing to open up the service. Brother Brinson, would you pray for us, please, sir? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, it is so good to have you this morning. We appreciate you coming out to worship with us, and we're excited to see you. Uh, amen. amen. Gorgeous weather outside. Yesterday was probably one of the better days that we've had. It was so not Augusty. Amen. amen. Uh, that little shower came through, and the temperature dropped about 10 degrees. Perfect day to load a U-Haul truck. Uh, amen. amen. And we got that all done, and Everyone except Kyle never hardly broke a sweat. But Brother Kyle, now he's a little different, amen. Besides which, we put him up in the back of that truck, uh, amen. So uh, anyway, we've got uh, Zach and Kate all loaded. They're ready to go. Uh, uh, and so today is our last opportunity to say our goodbyes to them. Uh, and uh, nothing we can do about it. We've tried. Uh, I thought about going over and letting the air out of the tires on the truck, but they just air them back up, uh, amen. No, we believe the Lord's leading them to what they're doing, Amen. and uh, we're going to continue to pray for them, stay in touch with them, uh, and be a part of their ministry when the time comes that we can do that. But we want to start by welcoming our visitors. We have a family visiting over here, and I think you told me you were from Tabernacle Baptist? Yes, sir. Yeah, in Roanoke, uh, uh, and I, they're out in this area, and Amen. I think they've moved out here. Uh, it's good to have them in our congregation, so you all make them feel uh, welcome. And like all teenagers, young people, listen to me now. Like all teenagers, she's not even a teenager, though, is she? How old is your daughter? Twelve. It is so hard to go to a new school yeah. or to a new church. And, you know, husband and wife, they've got each other's back. They don't need you. They're going to take you as you are. But this little one, she needs you to encourage her and make her feel welcome. Amen. Remember the first time you came in as a teen or as a young person uh, and sat there looking at all this. <laughs> That's a little scary. So you go out of your way, make those folk, folks feel welcome. Who else we got uh, that's visiting? Uh, pray for uh, uh, Brother and Miss Gentry. Uh, they're dealing with a loss in the friend's family or, or and having a funeral this afternoon, so keep them in your prayers. And we've got a gentleman down here, and I don't remember your name, brother. You're Curtis. 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 Uh, anyway, he drove all the way from New Mexico all night long. He said he drove all that distance just to come to church here. <laughs> Amen. Because he heard the preacher was good. I, I warn you right now, that's not always the truth. Amen. But uh, it is so good to have you. Did we get them a card? Oh, raise your hand, by the way. I forgot to say that. If you're visiting with us, just lift your hand up so we can see who you are. Uh, and this is Mrs. Patterson's uh, brother Amen. back on the back corner. I, I, I've met him before, but it's good to have him. Good to have Miss Patterson here with us as well. Amen. Uh, getting through all of that, if I don't hurry, I'm going to start using my <laughs> preaching time right now. I'm using Zach's time. But... Uh, uh, Please remember to pray for the Odells. Uh, Brother Miss Odell have COVID. Uh, Miss Odell is doing somewhat better. And I get two different stories. I've heard she has come home or she's going to come home. But you just keep praying for her. I know Brother Bobby's not doing well at all. Uh, so, And he's in the hospital in Fort Worth, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, so keep those folks in your, in your prayers, if you would. Amen. And then my brother and sister in law are here with us this morning. He pastors Bible Baptist Church in Ennis, Texas. Amen. And it's kind of strange. They went on vacation. They've been on vacation since last Monday. Uh, uh, and yesterday they left from somewhere. Uh, and Leroy, he's not one that likes to drive. He likes to be taken care of and Linda takes good care of him. And so he wrote out the directions for where they were going to a bed and breakfast last night, somewhere down in South Texas uh, or in te down there somewhere. Uh, and gave her the written out directions. He got over on his side of the car and went to sleep. And when he woke up, she asked him, are you about ready to drive? He said, yes. And he got out and got behind it, looked at the signs. And they were just outside of Mineral Wells. <laughs> a long way from where they were supposed to be. And so they called and said, hey, we're coming to see you. So uh, we've had the benefit of spending the last day and even today with my brother and sister-in-law. And that doesn't happen a lot. So 
uh, we count that as a blessing. We've got to eat out together and spend some time together, and we don't get to do that often. So if you're home folk, good to have you. If you're visiting, good to have you. Amen. 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 May the Lord bless you. Amen. And we've got people that are visiting that visit all the time. We appreciate you too. <laughs> well, I found out years ago that uh, some people can take directions, some people can't. That's right. <laughs> Some people can give directions, and some people can't. So <laughs> it works both ways. And we got someone here from Roanoke, from a Tabernacle Baptist Church. Brother Joe Tim's pastoring over there, right? I got saved under his ministry in this church. Not this building, but uptown. When, but uh, anyway, he was, he was the one that led me to the Lord. So he's, got a, he's always got a special place in my heart. And I know several of the members here remember him. That have been here that long. And he's Miss Patterson's grandson in her. Really? Ask her. Miss Patterson's grandson in law? Is that what you said? He is? Cool. Anyway, a great man, great pastor. It, it, uh, it just killed me when he left. But uh, he's been over at Roanoke ever since he left. This was his first church to pastor. And then he went to Roanoke. He's been over there ever since. That's a long time because you're really old. <laughs> <coughs> this is true. <laughs> well, you, you, you're quite a bit older than me, though. Yeah. Six months? <laughs> well, as, as you know, you've already been told, and a lot of you already know that uh, Brother Zach and Kate are going to be leaving us. And uh, so this, this is their last Sunday. They'll be leaving in the morning. And. Uh, Zach was feeling a little emotional. He wanted to go ahead and turn the serv song service over to me. So uh, hopefully I won't get too emotional here. And, uh, but we're going to have one more song. So we're going to ask you to stand at this time. We're going to sing hymn number 71, The Solid Rock. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. And we want our ushers to come. We'll receive, receive the morning offering. Then we've got a young group here that's going to sing for us this morning. Okay, second verse. <laughs> when darkness sees a hideous face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ's solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground. done this we've kind of changed these songs to kind of fit the way we want to do them but so <laughs> somebody hands you something you get up here and you, well let's see do I do this the way I used to do it or do we do it the way it's written or the way he does it or... anyway last verse when we shall come with temper sound Good to be in the Lord's house today. Amen. What a nice crowd, brother. You're going to enjoy preaching to this crowd. Amen. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Brother Ken, would you word our prayer, please? Lord, again, we're thankful, Lord, to be in your, your house today. Bless the offering we're about to receive this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
All right. Well, this is our future adult choir. So we're going to call them our junior Marshall, choir for right, right now. Here. And they got a, a special they're going to sing for us this morning before we turn the service over to Brother Webster. Right there. In second row, right there. Second row. Thank you. We appreciate that. Amen. I like to hear the kids sing. Yes. Amen. It's uh, awesome. Uh, they sing with just great commitment. Amen. They sing from their heart. Yes. And the choir director don't have to stand up there and say, y'all quit talking and sing. We have to say to them, speak up because all you adults scare them to death. Uh, amen. I'm going to invite you probably to the one of the most difficult portions of Scripture in the Bible that deals with the failure of people and the anger of God. Uh, and that is always a fearful place to go. Uh, so I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 1. <clears throat> when you find it, if you'll stand with me in honor of the Word of God, we will read a few verses. And for me, this is a long reading. For Zach, it's not. For Zach, he takes one verse and reads the whole chapter. Uh, amen. And if you don't watch him, he'll read the whole book. Uh, amen. And there's nothing wrong with that because the power of God's in the Word of God. Uh, amen. Sometimes I think we minimize the reading of the Word of God when in truth, we could stand up here and just read God's Word and God would still bless. Amen. Uh, probably more so than when we preach it, amen, sometimes, amen. But I want you to, when you read this, I want you to see the severity of God's language and the terribleness of His people. Read with me out of Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, uh, which was concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, uh, Ahia, Ahaz, that's not right, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. <clears throat> Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. If you are parents, you understand the, the heart of the Lord right here. Uh, when you've done all and put all into your children, and they will turn away from you and from your teachings and go and live like the very way that you would not have them to live. Amen. Go on. Uh, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have uh, forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. That's a, that just means backslidden. Amen. Uh, why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole heart is sick. The whole heart is faint. What God just said is there's no reason for me to continue to discipline you. You're so hard-hearted and so backslidden that whatever I do to you, you just ignore it or move on and, and see no, you don't see my hand in it. 
For the sole of the foot, even under the head, there is no soundness in it. But the wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither uh, mollified uh, with ointment. Your, your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land, strangers devour it in, in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughters of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, and a, and a lodge in a, a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left un, unto us a, a very small remnant, uh, we should have been as Sodom and as should have been as like unto Gomorrah. Remember in Romans we're studying about the remnant. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law o, uh, of, of God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of, uh, fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of hosts. In other words, God doesn't just take religion just because it's religion. Amen. When ye come in to appear before me, whom hath required this at uh, your, uh, your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain obl oblations. Uh, incense is, is an abomination to me. The new moon and the Sabbath, the callings of the assembly, I cannot away with it. Uh, it is iniquity, even the solemn meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. Wow. They are troublesome unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread your forth your hands, I will hide my eyes. By the way, spreading forth your hands means to worship. Amen. Amen. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make uh, many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash, wash you, make you clean, put away evil, and your doings for, uh, from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Re, uh, uh, relieve, and uh, relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Here's my text. All that you just read should bring a trembling to our heart. All that you just read should bring a tear to our eye that God's people, chosen by His grace, should walk in such rebellion to God to cause God such consternation. Amen. Listen to verse 18. And I don't know why He put it here other than grace. Listen to what He said. Come now. What? What? Did you read those first 17 verses? And now he says, come now. And let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You may be seated. Verse 18, as you're reading in verses, uh, the first 17 verses, you begin to say to yourself, oh my, oh my. This group of people, whoever they may be, be it Israel or America, whoever they may be, they're in trouble. Amen. Amen. And as you read that, you just begin to say to yourself, folks, you need to find somewhere to go. You need to find a deep hole. Call, crawl in and pull it in behind you because God is about to loose His wrath upon you. Yeah. And then I get down to verse 18 and I stop and I read that and I say, that doesn't belong. That doesn't belong there in the face of all that they've done. Uh, here God's inviting His people uh, to come and reason with Him. He's inviting those who are uh, uh, taken in sin. He's inviting those who are practicing sin. He's inviting those who are revealing the worst of humanity. And in, back in Genesis 6, I find when the world was like in that same character, God destroyed them all. And yet here He's saying, come and reason with me. Yeah. Amen. Amen? We would think that the world ought to be knocking at God's door begging for grace. Amen. That we ought to be crying out to Him for a solution to the terror that we dwell in and to the sinfulness of our own heart. Uh, uh, and yet I find that none seeketh after God. No, not one. In fact, I read in Luke uh, chapter 19 verses 10 where it says that God came seeking the lost. Yeah. Amen. And what I read in verses 18 is God's giving the estimation or the summation of what Israel is and its violence and its ugliness and its sin. And he says, listen, even at, the, even at that worst condition, there's grace. Amen. He says, come and reason with me. Isaiah is calling the people to come and find a clean dwelling place, a cleanness in God that will wash away the violence and the ugliness and the sin. Amen. Amen. By the way, that invitation still extends today. Yes. Amen. Amen. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord Amen. shall be saved. Amen. An invitation that is extended. And I want to take verse 18 
And because God puts it at the end of the first 17 verses, I want you to see how glorious grace is. And I want you to see when grace comes or when grace has the greatest value, I guess. Grace is always value. Amen. Amen. But sometimes we don't see grace. Sometimes we don't see the hand of God's love. Sometimes all we do is see the wickedness and the violence and the ugliness that is life. And I have to tell you, folks, if all you have in this world is what's going on around us right now, you are of all creatures most miserable. Amen. Because this place is a mess. And the messiness is not getting any better. And the solution's not in Washington. The solution's not in Austin. The solution's right here in God's church with God's people, with God's book, with God's message. Amen. And so I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to... We're going to start with three things. If we get through all three of them, we'll tell you as we go. I'm not going to give them to you all at once because I may not get to them. The first thing I want you to know is that God gives an invitation to come reason with Him at a most unreasonable time. Amen. Wouldn't you think God would come when Israel was walking in tall cotton? When Israel was uh, making a sacrifice at the, uh, at the time of the Passover, and when Israel's rejoicing in who God is, and when Israel, like it on Mount Carmel, when they say, God, He is God, uh, uh, when Israel's uh, uh, really looking toward heaven and excited and rejoicing with God and for God and for who He is, but yet here it is, it seems to be the most unreasonable time from man's perspective. This is a place when I'd say, folks, you're done. Be glad I'm not God in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17 verses. Because it's an unreasonable time for God to turn His attention of love toward humanity or toward Israel. Do you remember when God saved you? Amen. At the most unreasonable time. In fact, when I looked at it, when God first convicted my heart, He said, I save sinners. And I, like Paul, said, well, I'm the biggest one I've ever seen. And God said, but I will save you. And I said, you got to be kidding when that, when that man there at Maplewood Baptist told me, do you know God save, will save you? I said, no, that's not even reasonable. I know who I am. That's not reasonable. He said, but God died for you. And I said, that's not only not reasonable, that's not even logical. Yeah. Amen. Why would God come and offer salvation to someone like me and actually die that I might be able to, to be saved? Some of you understand what I'm talking about. I still don't understand it. And I go all the way back to that point and I say, that's the most unreasonable thing God ever done. But thank God for unreasonable grace. Grace means the, the, the favor of God beyond what you would deserve. Bible says where sin abounds, grace does far more abound. It's an unreasonable uh, uh, place when God comes and asks, says unto them, come, let us reason together. In an unreasonable place, God's going to find reason. You know what the reason is? His mercy. Amen. Amen. Isaiah uh, uh, sees his nation, sees the people in deep trouble. The people have rebelled against God. The first, what, verse 2, 3, 4, uh, right in there. They've, they've chosen uh, uh, to not think about God. Listen to this. This is awesome. We read through these things so quickly sometimes. Look at verse 3. The ox knoweth its owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, oh my goodness, uh, amen. And Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. They didn't even know who God was. But now wait. Had God not revealed Himself? Amen. Through these whole 17 verses, we're going to find out God's still revealing Himself. Right. They had made a personal choice to turn their back on God. Yeah. That's what's unreasonable. Amen. But in a time of when it wasn't reasonable, God comes with grace. Amen? Those who had uh, 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 been chastened, even to the point to where God said, it won't do any more good. <clears throat> I love using me for an illustration because I don't make me mad. <laughs> I use you, you get mad. Except Kyle, I use him all the time. And except Callie, I use her all the time too. She's just five weeks from dominoing. My mother was a saint. Not really. She was a harsh mother raising rebellious boys. Amen. 
<laughs> and she put her all into it. The only person you didn't want to deal with was daddy, but nevertheless. I remember one day we were, my twin brother and I was probably about 13, maybe. 13, right in there. We'd done something. My mother thought one thing cured all things. She would weigh the, boy, she'd beat you half to death, or try to. She's five foot, whatever she was. Her arms were probably about this long. And ladies, don't be offended at this. But if you've got sons, there reaches a point when you have no influence on them by your force. We did something, don't remember what it was, probably fighting or something. But she says, boys, me and my twin brother, get on that bed. Okie dokie. So we laid across the bed and she stood, we, my feet are here, Clifford's was here, and she stood right here with daddy's belt. Wham, 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 wham. And I don't know why it happened. It hurt. But somewhere when boys are growing up, they say, uh, uh, I'm a man. And so Clifford and I, while getting spanked, are laying there looking at each other, and he said to me, or I said to him, one or the other, expect how long she's going to continue this. <laughs> and one of the other ones said, I guess till she gets tired. And she just took that belt, and she said, I'll never do this again. It's totally useless. And she throwed that belt up against the wall and turned down and walked out. Guess who just won? That's exactly what God's saying about Israel. I've corrected you, and I've corrected you, and I've corrected you until the very hand of God makes you not change your direction. And he said, I won't do that anymore. When my mother walked out the door, she said something else. I'm going to tell your daddy. I, said, I would have said, Mama, please come back. I'll cry. <laughs> Whatever. She said, now there's no more grace. There's just Daddy to come. Daddy never came pleasantly. He never came saying, let's reason together. He came to say, look out. Amen. And so God's saying to Israel, to those who have selected and to turn against him and have refused to be corrected from it. I'm done. Yeah. Now comes the hard time. Amen? It's an unreasonable time, isn't it? When people are, are being chastened and they will not repent. Sounds like today, doesn't it? When God does everything he can to a people, to a nation, to a world. And what do we come up with? Well, it's climate change. Well, the things are just different than they used to be. It's just harsh. The economy's bad. On and on and on, when all we have to do is look up and Amen. see God at work. Amen. Amen. Good. Amen. But we will not look up. Yeah. This people, look in verse 6. From the sole of your foot, even under the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. In other words, we are in a mess and we're being bruised by our own attitude, by our own lifestyle. It's killing our kids and our people. Amen. Isn't it odd that we have all this stuff that comes every time we find a solution to one problem, there's another. We've got now, we've got the COVID thing. Amen? And when that's done, I pray God's not finished trying to correct. Amen. Amen. It's an unreasonable day. You want me to tell you how unreasonable it is? How many of y'all wear a mask? Raise your hand. You wear it? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed of wearing a mask. <laughs> how many of you wear it where you have to? You see how divided this country is Amen. over something so stupid as a mask? Amen. Amen. See, I'm not wearing it. I remember when I, oh, I got to hurry up. We ain't, we're not even off point one yet, brother. 
when I was growing up, I've always rode motorcycles. Amen. Y'all remember when the helmet rule came out? Remember in Texas when they first came out with the helmet law? Yeah. It wasn't optional. If you were over 18, you didn't get to say, I don't have to wear this. You had to wear it. And they told me why. They said, this is for your safety. By the way, I don't wear a mask either unless I have to. <laughs> this is for your safety. I had a nurse tell me, you know what you call a bike, a motorcycle rider that don't wear a helmet? Organ donor. Yeah. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I rode. I rode. I was riding with my twin brother, going through North Richland Hills, Haltom City. Cops stopped us. I had my helmet on. I don't know why, but I did. He had his on, his knee. <laughs> and that policeman said, uh, why aren't you wearing your helmet? He said, I am. <laughs> he said, no, you're not. The law says you have to wear it as it's prescribed by you the manufacturer for its use. Buckle on your head. By the way, it's illegal to wear a helmet with it not strapped on. Amen? Do you know it's illegal in my, oh my goodness, to not wear your seat belts? How many of y'all wear your seat belt? I do. You know why I do? Because my stinking truck won't shut up if you don't. <laughs> Amen? Anyway, back to my helmet. He got a ticket. And this is what he said. I won't wear that helmet if I get a ticket every other day. The next day, he got another one. The third day, he wore a helmet. Amen. But he was rebellious in his heart. You cannot legislate love or submission. Even a little boy, like wherever Preston is, he's in the back. I've watched Zach work on that boy. That little boy is about this tall, and he is the most obnoxious little boy when he wants to be that you've ever seen. And I've watched Zach work on him. I've watched Kate work on him. And it's just like that little boy when his daddy says, sit down, son. And he sits down and looks at him and says, what? And daddy says, what you think? And he says, well, I'm sitting down on the outside or sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up inside. <laughs> That's exactly where Israel is. No, where, no matter what God did to him. They said, we will not obey. Yeah. Right. And right then, we say, well, God, just get them. And God says, come, let us reason together. Let me show you in the face of your rebellion in an unreasonable time how much grace can do for you. And then I found also that God says, come reason with us, gives an invitation to the nation of God uh, when it's in an ungodly time. Amen? It, just go over, if you might, let me get back to where I was. i got to turn the page here. Uh, to the book of Isaiah, and verses 11, if you would. Now I went too far. It says this, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Mm. Very religious day, isn't it? They're doing everything they can for themselves. Yeah. Romans says that when they knew God, they glorified Him not. But didn't mean they gave up religion. They began to make idols and images Amen. and find their own solution to their own sin. That's exactly what Adam did in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible said that when they ate of that tree, they saw that they were naked. What they saw was that they also had lost something. They lost holiness. They lost that purity. It was gone. And they saw themselves as they were sinners. Amen. And Adam said, what shall we do? It never dawned on him to call out and say, God, we messed up. What he said was, what can I do about this problem? And he came up with a good idea. He sewed fig leaves together. I noticed something about leaves. My wife has a little plant. Whatever, what is that thing? Where are you, Sharon? Oh, there you are. What is that plant that we moved that got the little leaves on it that you use for a Christmas tree? Huh? Whatever she's saying. What was it? Ficus? Okay, ficus tree. We put that in the back of my car or truck, took it down to our duplex that we just leased in Decatur, got it down and set it in. It did not look like it had been harmed at all. 
because my wife's had it for a while. It's grown and it's a ficus tree, whatever that means. And I noticed this morning, great illustration. God gave me this this morning coming through my house. I looked over in the corner where I'd set it, and there were leaves all on the floor. Brown leaves. You know what I found out about what Adam's solution was? Even if God had not come into the garden, those fig leaves were going to have to be changed every once in a while. Because they're going to dry out and become crumbly, and they're going to leave you seeing yourself as naked. So self-righteousness has to be an ongoing protection for my wickedness. Got to continue to make me right. Because those leaves are getting stiff. I found out when a man turns over a new leaf. That's what I did the first time I asked God to save me. I didn't get saved. I just turned over a new leaf. But I found out something. A green leaf full of moisture, full of greenery, it'll lay right there even when the wind blows and it'll stay on that side. But as it begins to dry, it sure gets light. And something goes, and that leaf goes. Israel had no solution and didn't want a solution. Yet they had great religion. Impress them anyway. Amen? Much, much was going on to no value. Amen? There was a time of ungodliness when there was much religion. Verse 11, which we just read, it says this, uh, what, are the, what is it eat? And I delight not, the latter part, not in the blood of bulls and of lambs and of goats. Not true! You say, is God lying? No. God's warning. You see, in the Old Testament law, the blood covered sin and rolled it away year by year. Rolled it all the way down to the cross where when God laid His blood on the mercy seat and sat down on the right hand of the Father, sins that had been put under the blood of bulls and goats had been, uh, had been covered up, was forgiven. And those people of the Old Testament that were in paradise where Abraham was were brought into the very presence of God because the way had been made. Amen. And God said, that don't work. What do you mean, God, it don't work? You're the one who said it did work. Can God make a mistake? God said, when you bring that blood, bring it by faith. Amen. When you bring that blood, bring it by a, 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 a repentant heart, a contrite heart. When you bring that blood, you look at your sin and you see my holiness and you know that that blood is the solution to your sin. It's not just religion. God says, when you just do it for religious sake, I will not receive that blood because it wasn't done by faith. Amen. They didn't have a problem with religion, did they? They had all kinds of religion. Amen? In verse 4, he says this, A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. Now, let me ask you a question. What's seed do? It grows. The Bible says if you take a grain of, seed, uh, of wheat and you put it in the ground, it comes up multiplied. One seed makes a whole head. You ever planted corn? Me and that heavy little brother of mine back there. <clears throat> we lived in Fort Worth, Texas, actually North Lisbon Hills, and Leroy bought this house. And in the back was a fenced off with storm fence area that the man who had owned it before had was a garden, garden spot well cared for, been plowed every year, been fertilized. I mean, this was a garden spot. We was raised on, on a farm. My daddy thought a garden was four or five acres. <laughs> and Leroy, and when I left the farm, I said, that's it, never, ever again. Actually did break the hoe handle out of my hoe. Yeah. But Leroy came over and says, Dale, let's plant a garden. I said, no. He said, yeah, let's do. So him and I, did Cliff, was Clifford involved in that? Uh, Willie and Paula, me and you, and I think that was all, three couples. Of we planted the garden. Been a while since we'd planted a garden. So we decided we were going to plant things like potatoes and uh, uh, purple hole peas, because you can harvest them more than one time. Okra. okra. We planted okra. And we planted squash. Yeah. Yellow, crook neck squash, Brother Irwin. Planted 
eight, nine hills of squash for three families. We only put a couple of seeds in each hole, just nine holes. We were throwing squash at each other. That garden produced so much that when it was in full growing thing, we're out there working. I told Leroy, I said, Leroy, I've had enough of this. I'm going to pick what the weeds don't get. We couldn't give it away. And the seed just kept producing. And when there's an evil seed in a nation or a people, it will just keep producing. And when you hand it down to your children, it produces even more. Until the generation after generation, the ungodliness manifests itself until the nation says, what in the world are we going to do? Have you heard that around this country any time so recently? In a time when we have COVID and everybody's on YouTube. I mean, you can't turn YouTube on without finding somebody preaching something. In a nation of religion. And yet it seems in the midst of all that religion, the blessings of God have been taken away. I am so glad that when I read the first 17 verses and I get to the end of verse 17 and I think, oh God, what are you going to do? Oh Israel, you're in such trouble that he puts verse 18 in there. Come, let us reason together. Amen? Don't you like verse 9 and 10? In fact, Matthew says, as it is in the days of, uh, or at the, in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, so it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, he's going to use the same reference right here. Amen? Look in verse 9 of chapter 1. Except the Lord of hosts hath left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been as Gomorrah. Let me tell you something. In a time of religion does not mean we're pleasing to God. But thank God for the remnant. We're not going back to Romans. I just want to show you this. You remember Abraham? Abraham was in his tent one day, just taking it easy. It was the middle of the day. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> and there came a man to him, or actually three. And Abraham meets him in the door of the tent, pre-incarnate Christ. And uh, Jesus said, should I hide from Abraham that which I'm going to do? And he said, no, I'm going to tell him. He said, Abraham, see these two boys here, these angels? Amen. I'm going to send them down to Sodom and Gomorrah and they're going to destroy it. Amen. Yeah. And Abraham said, wait God. Wait God. What if there's righteous people down there? Would you destroy the hold of the city and all the righteousness that might be there for the sake of those sinners? Would you if there was a hundred and you know the story. He, he talks to God. And Abraham finally gets down to his final conversation. He said, God, if there are ten, do you know ten righteous people could have, spore, could have spared Sodom and Gomorrah? God would have given them another chance for ten righteous people. Abraham thought he had it made. He surely knew that there was ten. Go read the story, folks. Lot was down there who had been with Abraham for years. Lot's wife was down there, who's going to end up a pillar of salt. Lot's sons and daughters and sons-in-laws and daughters-in-law. Read it. Read how many. And just write over here a little check like you do if you're playing 42. One mark for every time you make it. There should have been 14 righteous people minimum just in Lot's family. Abraham said, I know I've got a nephew down there. He loved God. He walked with God. He saw the hand of God. Surely he and his children will still love God. And you know what? Only three people survived Sodom. Abraham and two daughters. And those two daughters are going to sin with their own father and raise up probably the worst enemies Israel is ever going to have. Do you know what may be sparing God's hand in this nation right now? The righteous. We're plenty full of sin. Sodom and Gomorrah, no worse than we are. 
sin, righteousness, spareth a people. In the midst of religion, God says, let us reason together. Because religion won't get it. Amen? Let me give you just one more, and I know I'm about to run out of time. He gives an invitation. He says, come and let us reason together in a critical time. Amen. Somebody define critical for me. If you're setting, they don't have this anymore. My stepfather was probably one of the most talented people. He could walk into a town where unemployment was 99.9% .9 and have a job in five minutes. He could do anything. He was a, he was a lineman. Uh, he was a great leather worker. He could make you a pair of boots. Uh, he was a, a, a boiler. I don't, we don't have them anymore. A boiler, whatever they call it. Bo something. He took care of boilers. Amen. Because back in the day, big buildings and everything were taken care of. They had boilers in them and you had to have an attendant there because it was a gauge that said, getting hot, getting hot, getting hot and blow up. This criticalness is like sitting by a boiler and you're watching the heat gauge and it comes up, comes up and right here's where it ought to operate. It just keeps going. And here's the little area that's marked off in red. It says, red, it's hot, red, it's hot. Down here on this end it says, run! This time in Isaiah is critical. I was working for the phone company years ago. I was in the Butler office, which is in Watauga. Y'all know what the busiest day in the year is for the phone company? Some of you do. Who said Mother's Day? It is Mother's Day. It is. I was working on that day, Mother's Day. I'd been, we were working overtime. We were putting in some new equipment. And you're in there. And, and this was a number five crossbar. That doesn't mean any to you, but what it means is that everything in there was mechanical, except the office computer. It's mechanical. It's going as everything's working. Every long line's working. Every dot, everything's working. And it's so much the equipment is working so much that it's almost deafening, and yet it's the sound of the day. You adjust to it. And all of a sudden it goes. Nothing's working. The whole office shut down because of the input of the load. And on the central office computer that run the number five, we were going from there to ESS, it had a big red light. I'd never seen it work. It was there. And they told us that light means get your hat and run. It was going beep, beep, beep. I did just what they said. I got my hat and left. And it took them two days. If you lived in Fort Worth back in those days, it took two days to get all those phones out at Watauga and back in that area up again because the whole office shut down. This is what God said. The light's flashing. It's critical. Yeah. You're setting at ground zero. Nuclear explosion has a ground zero. And depending on the size of it, it has a death rate, a 100% death rate, to a certain measurement of distance out from its explosion. Amen? When you know there's going to be, and they say, boy, this is going to blow up right here, and it's going to have a, 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 an outreach of, of, of 25 miles, everything within a 25-mile radius is dead. And you say, and they tell you, you've got X amount of time. What are you going to do? Go get you a picnic lunch and sit down? You're fixing to run because it's critical. It's a critical time. You've got to get past that 25-mile mark. And by the way, when you get past the 25-mile mark up to 35 miles, the death rate's only 80%. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? It's critical. This is a critical time. God said, come and reason with me. It's like this. God said, last chance. 
grace, it goes beyond sin. Where grace does, or where sin doth abound, grace doth far more abound. God said, last chance. Come reason with me. Make one more decision uh, according to my grace and come and reason with me. If my people who are called by my name will repent. Yes. And then if you read it, then will I heal their land. Last chance. I know this is not true for all of you. Some of you, the first time that God ever dealt with you about being saved, you got saved. Because it just took your heart by storm. It just caused you to lay aside all that you were and seek the grace of God and understand that God would save you and you, you did it. Bless God for you. Hallelujah. But my mama used to say, that we were just, a, and by that I mean myself and my brothers, were a little stubborn. And that we responded better to a two before than we did to love. Amen? God loves you and loved me beyond what I can comprehend. He loved me by grace. And He came and sought me. But this is what happened for me. Now, it may not have been this way for you. God said, and by the way, the first time I knew that God wanted me to get saved was when Clifford was in the hospital in Gladewater having wrecked that truck and died twice on the operating table, my twin brother. I was going down there on a motorcycle as fast as that sucker would run. I mean, I had it cranked open. I was laying down on the tank and I was cruising. I was an agnostic. We didn't know anything about God, didn't go to church, hadn't been in church. So I called my, I, anyway. I'm saying, God, if there's a God, don't let my brother die. God, if there's a God, I'll find you. I'll seek you out if you'll let my brother live. My brother's uh, 75 years old. Now, he lived. I quickly forgot that. Yep. So God got my attention with a two before. And I made a profession of faith, but the leaf started to dry out. It started flipping back over and sin started manifesting itself. And I started wanting to do what I used to do because I was sick of religion. And one night about 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm saying, sometime after church, on, I was in church. Because that's what you're supposed to do if you get religion. But as a sign used to say at Bible Baptist and Bowie, picture of a guy sitting in a chicken house. Chicken's all around him. He's sitting on a roost and underneath it said, sitting in a chicken house don't make you a chicken no more than sitting in church makes you a believer. Amen. And that night God came and He said to me, last chance. Last chance. When God says that, you better believe it. Now I understand had I said no, God would have moved that hand of grace and that conviction would have gone away. Maybe my brothers or somebody would have prayed for me and by God's loving for their prayers, God may have... I don't know. What I knew is me and God came to a point where it was critical. And I knew it. Now I've heard... I thought that... I thought I was peculiar. Nobody ever had that before. And then I found out when I tell my testimony about that at night, I find out there's a lot of people God does that with. Because God wants you to see that button, get your hat. God wants you to know you're sitting by a boiler that's about to blow up. God wants you to know it's critical. And He says to Israel, come and reason with me. I have the solution to your circumstance. I have the solution to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the condition of sin, the violence, the murder, the hatred, all that you've become because of sin and leaving the holiness of God. Come and reason with me and I will heal your land. God said to me that night, come and reason with me. Now listen, God's not going to reason with you about how good your sin is. That's right. He wants you to reason with Him concerning the gospel message of Christ, the blood that will forgive your sin. And the only reasonable explanation God will accept is, Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me. Amen. Then have you reasoned with God. Yeah. 
God's still calling. In a world that, as I look at it, seems to have gone past the point of no return. That wickedness has consumed us from the top to the bottom. And I do understand that we're living in a day that is unreasonable. The sin that we deal with every day, it's unreasonable Amen. for a man to go to a, a, a teller at a bank or a, a, a what is those things you get money out of? Uh, yeah, ATM, and get shot for a $10 bill. That's not reasonable. For a woman to stall, scald her children in burning water and kill them, that's not reasonable. For husbands to leave their wives and leave their children without support and go off and do their, that's not reasonable. Right. We're living in that day that it's not reasonable. Amen. But I've got a gracious God. Amen. I've seen Him heal homes. Yeah. I've seen Him heal nations. I've seen revival come. So have you. We're living in an unreasonable time, but we still have a reasonable God, do we not? Amen. We're living in a day when religion seems to be everywhere. We're living in a day when ungodliness is the mark of the time. But with ungodliness seems to come a manifestation of churches. Yep. Right. Of every brand and flavor. I wonder why that is so that I can make God over in my image. Amen. And I can worship those golden calves as did Israel when he brought them out of Egypt and I can say, this be the gods that brought me up out of Egypt. But they weren't the gods that brought him up, were they? Amen. Do you remember what those two golden or that golden calf did for Israel? When it gets melted down and put into the water? and they drink from that which they called God, there is no life in it, just death. Amen. Thank you, brother. We're living in an unreasonable time. We're living in a day when there's an ungodliness about us. But we're living in a day when God still says, Come, reason with me, though your sins be as scarlet, Wow, I will make them white as wool. I love Revelation. I love Revelation when God says, I'm going to put you in robes worth white in the blood of the Lamb. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'm going to see you through a blood of the Lamb. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'm going to see you pure white. Wow. Are we past the point of no return? Leroy, the other day, he said, when he woke up going into wherever it was they were at, Mineral Wells, he said, it's two and a half hours back to where we're supposed to be. By the way, it wasn't his wife's fault when he wrote the directions he forgot to put a turn in. <laughs> but we've gone too far. We've got a bed and breakfast down there, but we've gone too far. God offers love and grace, but we can go past the point of no return. Amen. The Bible says, it's appointed unto men once to die. Listen to this, because we never quote this part. But after this, the judgment. The point of no return. But here today, in a world of grace, where grace is still flowing, Amen. though we have a remnant of believers in this world that seems to be filled with religion. God still says, come. Whosoever will might come. Isn't God good? Well, I'm going to ask you right here this evening, if you would, and I'm not sure who's doing the invitation, but whichever one of you it is, stand with me. Lord God, as we come to you this morning, no doubt we're living in a time of sinfulness. While we look at ourselves and say, we're not so bad. Surely we're okay. God don't care, but He does. Lord, I pray that you will just bless this morning this invitation. Lord, for those who have turned away, who know that their name's in the Lamb's book, but Lord, they're not walking it. They're not living it. God, they'll come this morning and they will turn back to their God, back to God. The existence of this nation, of this world may depend upon just a few righteous people. Lord, I know it's an unreasonable day.
but we pray, God, just still for the grace that comes from your hand. Bless, Lord, now in Jesus' name. Amen. Page three.